Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Do keep uh, 1 Thessalonians open in front of you. Um, God's will for your life. Have you, ever, have you ever wondered what that might be? You know, have you, ever, have, you, have you ever asked that question? You know, what is it that God wants me to do with my life? What is, what is God's plan? You know, have you ever been maybe uh, slightly frustrated or, or felt that God is um, maybe being a bit vague and you wish he would be a bit more clear about what his will for your life is? Uh, do you sometimes feel kind of that, that God is a, a, a bit elusive on that front, that he has this plan but he doesn't tell you what it is? You know, have you ever prayed, Father, Father, please tell me what your will is? Did you ever feel yourself hoping or wishing or praying that, that God would kind of make it abundantly obvious in really, really kind of big, clear letters what his plan for your life is? Now, of course, if he did do that, you know, if he wrote it down for you, you'd kind of have to take... You'd have to take note, wouldn't you? Uh, you wouldn't be able to kind of uh, debate it or m- m- mull it over or, or, or kind of discuss it. There wouldn't be any kind of options to ignore it. If God kind of, if God did give you uh, His will for your life, you know that wouldn't be some kind of option for you to discuss, would it? It would be clear and it would be non-negotiable. I don't know if you spotted it in this passage. It is right there in front of you. God has done exactly what we've probably all prayed that he would do. Father, make clear to me your will for my life. What is your will for my life? Have a look. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Have a look in your Bibles. It's written down so you know that I'm not making this stuff up. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. There you go. That, that's uh, that's the kind of the, the, the whole gist of the passage. Um, I've only got two points, and that's the first one. God's will is for you to be like Jesus. That is God's will for your life. He has written it clear and blatant and obvious in a non like you can't. You, you, it's it's obvious. It's clear that there's no confusion about what God is saying here. Is there? This is God's will for your life that you should be sanctified that word sanctified means to kind of to be more and more holy um, which in itself means to to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ to be more and more like Jesus that's what sanctification is Um, he is the Lord Jesus is the most pure holy perfect person ever and sanctification is the process whereby we who are sinful and guilty grow to be more and more like him doing the kind of things that he would do, being the kind of person that he was, having the same kind of characteristics and attitudes that he had. That is God's will for your life. It it may not be what you hoped he would write down when you prayed that God would make his will clear to you, but nevertheless, that is what he has written down. Maybe this is one of those verses you should highlight, and so next time you're not sure what God's will is, you've got it written down nice and clear for you. It is God's will. This is what God wants. This is God's plan. This is how he set things out. This is the direction that he is going in, and this is the direction that we're obliged to follow him in. That you should be sanctified. Uh, so for a, a non-Christian, that means the first step of repentance and faith, doesn't it? The first step of being sanctified means to, um, to, to follow Christ, to put your trust in Christ, to um, stop uh, rebelling against him, to stop trying to be in charge of our own lives, to uh, follow and trust him. And then for a Christian, it means that deliberate but gradual growing in our reliance, our trust, our holiness our maturity our christ-likeness being rooted and grounded in him and repenting regularly reminding ourselves daily of his death and resurrection and how our, our sins are forgiven and how he calls us to to be like him god's will is for you to be like jesus uh Paul says a little bit more than that, doesn't he? Uh, So verse 3 is very general. 
um, sanctification. Uh, and then in the following two paragraphs, he spells out a, a few kind of particulars. You know, sanctification is a massive idea. You know, all of life is, is involved in sanctification. But Paul zooms in on two particular things. Um, uh, have a look at verse second half of verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And then he zooms in particularly on kind of moral purity, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is honorable, holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And in this manner, you should, uh, you should not, uh, in this manner, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Uh, so his first kind of particular that he zooms in on is this idea of uh, moral purity. Um, uh, and he has this idea, doesn't he, of kind of living uh, kind of self-controlled lives, which is stark because we live in a world that is the opposite of that. We live in a world where um, lack of control is, is seen to be kind of the desirable uh, feature of life, isn't it? Doing whatever you want, whatever you think you might enjoy, whatever makes you happy, you carry on, do that. No one's allowed to tell you not to do anything. If you think it might be fun, you, you just go and do it and don't let anyone stop you. Live your own life, be yourself. Don't live the life that other people expect. All, all that kind of stuff is, is parading in front of us time and time again, isn't it? And Paul says, actually, you need to live in such a way that you control yourself in a world that is characterized by lack of control. And that means battling against covetousness and lust, doesn't it? Being dissatisfied with what God has given us and being convinced that something else out there would be better. Um, you know, for men, it's obviously a often a, a, a physical covetousness, isn't it? For, for women, it's often a, a kind of an emotional or, or kind of characteristic covetousness. But being dissatisfied with what God has given us, being convinced that God is withholding things from us and therefore going after something that isn't ours. Paul says, Look, actually, you need to live a life of control, of self-control in a world that is out of control. Control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not like the pagans, the, the people around you, the non-Christians, who, who, uh, who, who have no self-control. Um, more than that, not just control of ourselves, but also kind of care of each other. And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Again, can you see there's a stark countercultural thing here? Purity uh, and sanctification for, for Christians means looking out for other people in a world that is actually just thriving on selfishness and individualism. I do what's best for me. I look out for my, my path. I choose what life and how I'm going to con conduct myself. And Paul says, no, actually, that's not what God has planned for your life that actually you, you plan your life in a way that doesn't take advantage of other people, doesn't leave other people in ruins afterwards, doesn't just drop people because, you know, you no longer feel attracted to them or no longer feel that they make you your best version of yourself, and so you just kind of chuck them aside and go and look for someone or something else. Paul says, actually, no, we don't do that. We don't use other people for our own uh, kind of satisfaction and benefits no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be looking to care for other people. That actually the, the path of sanctification, the path of purity is caring more about the well-being of others than about yourself. It's the pattern we see modeled in Jesus, isn't it? And it's the pattern that Paul calls the, uh, the Thessalonians to. So he, he kind of first zooms in on this idea of purity and, and control and looking after other people rather than just looking out for ourselves. And then verse 9 through to verse 12, he, he, he zooms in on this idea of sanctification in terms of loving one another. We've seen this a couple of times in Thessalonians already. Verse 9. 
Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And in fact, you, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that in your daily life you may win the respect of outsiders and you will not be dependent on anybody. Can you see Paul establishes, well, he doesn't establish, it goes all the way through the New Testament, but he kind of zooms in on this pattern that we see again and again and again, that you love one another, that you treat each other with love and care, and that you're deeply concerned for the well-being of those around you, particularly of your brothers and sisters, that you care for each other. And that, says Paul, is a pathway to winning the respect of outsiders. The New Testament makes this connection loads and loads, doesn't it? The way we love each other as Christians is the primary method that we uh, have avenues to speak to our non-Christian friends and family about the gospel, about Jesus. That we win their respect, that we earn their opportunity to explain to them how and why we treat other people the way we do, uh, and it all boils down to the way that Jesus has treated us. Uh, and all of this comes under Paul's bracket, if you like, of l- how to live in order to please God, how to um, live according to God's will, how to be sanctified, that we would grow not only in our own individual purity and um, uh, uh, holiness, but that actually we would be sanctified together as a corporate body, that we would love one another more, that we would all be growing to love each other more. And again, Paul says some quite countercultural things, doesn't he? You should mind your own business uh, and, uh, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to work with your hands, as in to, to do your own work, to have your own kind of um, uh, way that you conduct yourself, to have your own work, to have your own job where that's appropriate. Uh, he doesn't mean that everyone has to work with their hands like a kind of a laborer or a builder, but everyone should be doing their own work so you're not dependent on other people that you should lead a, a quiet and diligent life. Uh, again, we live in a world, don't we, where actually the, the, the gold star that you get is to how much influence can you have? How many followers can you have on social media? How, much, how, how wide a reach do you have in your, in your uh, circles? And Paul says, actually, the way to win respect, uh, the way to be sanctified, the way to God's plan is that you should just lead a quiet life. Strive to not really influence anyone. Just focus on maturity and holiness. Uh, And actually, uh, counterintuitively, you'll have much greater influence as we do that than if we scrabble to have more and more influence, to have more and more fame and uh, and input in other people's lives. God's will is for you to be like Jesus. That is God's plan for your life. He has made it abundantly clear. That means we should strive to do these things. You know, uh, we said at the start, you know, if God really did answer our prayers, God, what is your will for my life? You know, if he made that clear to us, if he wrote it down in black and white, we wouldn't be able to argue with it, would we? We would have to just take it and go with it. And we've seen that God does exactly that. He has written down his will for your life. Therefore, it is our job to fall in line and to follow this. That's what Paul says isn't it? In, in verse 2. For you know that the instructions that we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. When Paul writes to these Thessalonians, he doesn't say, um, I've got a load of ideas of things you could do. Here's a couple. If you like them, you can take them. And if not, then just put them aside and, and try something else. He doesn't say, he says, we wrote to you under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and there is no opportunity for you to, um, uh, to open that up for debate. He says the same thing down in verse 8. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. God's will is for you to be like Jesus. That means we are all to be striving to be like Jesus. That is a plain and clear 
command of Scripture. God's will is for you to grow in holiness. There is no debate about that. We should strive to do that. We should strive to grow more and more to be like Jesus. But there's another way, a slightly different way of approaching that, isn't it? A slightly different way of thinking about that. Uh, That we take this verse not merely as just an instruction, but as, if you like, a new pair of spectacles, a new way of looking at life and all the things that we have. If it is God's will, clearly and and, and immovably, that we should be sanctified, if that is God's plan for everyone's life, then it changes the way we look at our own lives, doesn't it? That we put on, if you like, a different set of glasses and we see things slightly differently. Why has this thing happened? Why don't I have this when I would really quite like this? Uh, Why do I have this when actually I'd prefer that? Why can't I have that other thing? Why has God brought this situation about? Why has God blessed me in this way? Why is he challenging me in in this way? Can you see the answer to every single one of those questions is for your sanctification. God is unfolding your life, putting all kinds of different things, some hurdles, uh, some comforts in your path, for your sanctification whatever thing it is that's going through your head right now that you're worried about next week or in the coming months it is there for your sanctification Uh, whatever thing you're rejoicing over the most at the moment uh, god has put it in there uh, for your sanctification that you learn to thank him and, and enjoy all of his benefits and blessings god's will is for you to be like Jesus, to grow moment by moment, day by day, to be more like Jesus. That is clear and that is universal. And if, if I just stopped speaking now, you know, it would maybe be like other sermons you, you've heard. Now, unfortunately, preachers like me often make the mistake of, of saying things like this. You know, look, God wants you to be holy. Off you go. Go and be holy. And, and, we, and we do ourselves, uh, we do everyone uh, misjustice by doing that. And we don't tell you the full story. You know, I can remember sitting through sermons, I'm sure you can too, uh, sitting through sermons that talk about holiness and maturity and sanctification uh, and really just have the effect of inducing uh, guilt and shame and, and make everyone feel that they're not matching up and that uh, only some can it succeed uh, and there's, um, we're really just left to our own devices for this. That's not the gospel that, uh, that what Paul preaches to 1 Thessalonians. And it's not the uh, gospel that... Uh, we, I want to, you to focus on this morning. Not only is it that God's will is for you to be like Jesus, but in this passage there is, if you like, a secret weapon. We're told God's very method for doing this. God's will is that you would be like Jesus. God's method is for you to know Jesus. You see, this call for everyone to grow in holiness, to live holy and um, uh, pure lives, it is not a case of simply stating the fact and then saying, off you go, go and do it yourselves. You're on your own now. There are a few clues in this passage that that's not what Paul means. It's not what God means uh, us to understand by this. Uh, One of them is in verse 5. Uh, so uh, conduct yourselves in a way that is honor- holy and honorable not in passionate lusts like the pagans who do not know God can you see as, as Paul kind of mentions these, these pagans these non-Christians he says that the problem with those guys is not just that they're bad and they do bad things the problem is that they do not know God. They don't know who it is that they're supposed to be like. They don't know what it is they're supposed to be like. They have no frame of reference and so no help. Can you see the implication that Paul's making is the pagans behave like that because they do not know God. Whereas you Christians, you're not to be like that. Can you see the implication? Because you do know God. 
the source of sanctification, of growing, of living to please God, is not just a case of us mustering it from within ourselves. The source of sanctification is knowing God. This goes all the way through the Bible. I remember noticing it particularly years and years ago when we preached through Leviticus. The, the, the idea of holiness is never, here's a standard that is just, it's just some kind of arbitrary, you have to live up to this standard. Holiness is always defined in relation to a person. Holiness is not reaching a certain style of things you do and things you don't do. Holiness is always about your relationship with God. There's a couple more clues as to how um, God intends us to be sanctified. Our next one comes in verse 8. Therefore, anyone who rejects uh, this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who has given you, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Can you see there, Paul lays it out nice and clearly uh, that this understanding and obedience to his call to sanctification is not left to you to kind of muster the strength to do it by yourselves it is driven by the holy spirit and the role of the holy spirit all the way through scripture is to point people to jesus that's what the spirit does that is his job he dwells in us to point us to christ and to make us look like jesus God's method for holiness is not just pull your socks up and try harder. The method is for you to know Jesus. Uh, we, we see one more evidence of this in verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. What does that phrase, taught by God, to mean? You know, does it just mean that Paul has turned up and, and said, look, you have to love one another. Paul's an apostle. The apostles are God's messengers. Therefore, uh, by implication, the, the people have been taught by God because they've been taught by Paul to love one another. I, I don't think that's what it means. I, I think it means they've been taught by God because they know what God has done. They have seen how God has loved other people. They know that God gave his one and only son because he loved the world so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life they've seen what it is for God to love one another the thing that drives their love for one another is not that they've been told to love one another it's that they've witnessed it and experienced it from the hand of God himself they've seen how God has acted his character how he's given himself up given up his one and only son they've seen how jesus has sacrificed himself gladly for the well-being of others for their safety for their security they've seen and experienced and and felt the blessings of god's character his compassion his um, holiness they haven't just been taught by god in that god um instructed them they've been taught by God in that God demonstrated and nurtured and modeled to them what love for one another looks like Uh, can you see how all these little little pieces fit together God's will for your life is that you grow more and more like Jesus and God's method is not that you just try harder it is that you know Christ more and the more you know Christ the more you'll be like Christ and so the more that God's will will be conformed in you You know, reformed evangelical churches like ours are, 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 are very good, aren't we? We're very well known for, for holding to and maintaining that people are saved by faith. You know, that we are saved not by trying to kind of win God's favor, but we're saved by faith in Christ. We don't earn salvation. It is given to us. We are saved as we put our trust, our reliance in Christ. Unfortunately, we're not as well known for teaching the same thing about sanctification. But it's true, isn't it? We're saved by faith and we are sanctified by faith. 
You're not sanctified by working harder. It's not that God says, oh, come and trust in Jesus to be saved, and now you're saved. You have to go and work really, really hard. You're on your own. We've got you uh, kind of off the starting line. You've got to finish the race by yourself. That's not how it goes. It is you're saved as you put your trust in Christ, as you accept and confess your complete helplessness and inability to save yourself. And you're sanctified as you confess your complete inability to grow to be like Jesus without the help of Jesus. Isn't it ridiculous that we convince ourselves week after week that we have to somehow match up. We have to try and be like Jesus and that we have to do that by ourselves. That would be a mean God to ask that of us, wouldn't it? But he doesn't. He says, look, my will is for you to grow more and more like Jesus. I want you all to be like Jesus on the day that he returns. And I'm going to work that through you by giving you the Holy Spirit, uh, by making myself known to you, by giving you the Lord Jesus Christ as your, uh, not only your savior, but also your model, the one who sanctifies you and, and demonstrates what it is to follow the Father. And so can you see when Paul starts chapter 4 and says, uh, talks about how to live in order to please God. You know, maybe when you've heard that phrase, maybe we've had it as our series title, how to live to please God. Maybe that idea makes a kind of uh, a lump appear in your throat. How can we do that? I'm, I feel like I'm failing at that. I'm not able to do that. You see, when God calls us to live to please him, it's not a mean trick whereby he kind of sets this assault course out and says, right, off you go, let's see who trips over first. God says, live in order to please me. And I'll give you Christ, not only as your savior, but also as your sanctifier. See, this is... This is good news, isn't it? God has set an immensely high standard for your life. He wants you to grow every minute to be more like Jesus. And if that was the end of the story, that would be a mean thing to do because you can't do that by yourself. But he hasn't done that. He said, I expect you to grow every minute, every day, to be more like Jesus. And I'm giving you Jesus. And I'm giving you the spirit of Christ to dwell inside you so that you can grow in Christ. Cling to him more and more. Repenting, confessing, following, imitating daily, reminding ourselves of our inability uh, to be anything like Jesus without the help of Jesus. And so you can see why Paul writes what he writes. Now we ask you and we urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Paul's prayer for these Thessalonians, Paul's instruction for these Thessalonians it's not only that they would grow to be more like Jesus, but they would do that through knowing Jesus more and more. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that you have given us Christ, that he died to forgive our sins in our place, that he rose, that he ascended, Father, thank you that you saved us through faith in Christ. Uh, Father, as we think about your will for our lives, we ask that you would help us to grow more and more in our knowledge of Christ, in our dependence on him, that we would be rooted and grounded in him, firmly established in him, knowing that go, growing in Christ-likeness is not something we do on our own, but something we do through Christ himself. Father, I pray for it all of us here, 
Uh, everyone listening, Father, in the room, people listening online, Father, I pray that for each of us, you would root us firmly in Christ, that we would grow in our knowledge of him and so grow in our likeness to him. Amen.